Before the internet was enamored with Rocket Raccoon and Groot, even before Al Gore had even invented the series of tubes known as the internet, we here at Comic Archivist do know that Al Gore did not invent the internet, nor that the internet is a series of tubes. There was another team of Guardians of the Galaxy, now currently being introduced using people like Sly Stallone and Miley Cyrus in the hit film Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. But long before that, the team first appeared in January 1969 in an issue of Marvel Superheroes, written by Arnold Drake and penciled by Gene Colan. The premise basically is that in an alternate Marvel timeline, though we don't know it's an alternate timeline at the time, dubbed Earth-691, in 3007, Captain Charlie-27 returns to his home on Jupiter, only to discover that it had been taken over by the Badoon, an alien race that kinda looks like if David Icke designed the Skrulls. While running for his life, Charlie-27 runs into a man made of crystal from Pluto named Martinex, and together they teleport back to Earth. Meanwhile, Major Vance Astro, an astronaut from the 20th century, is told to kill his friend Yandu Udanta, a blueskin centaurian. No, not a blueskin centaur. He's from Alpha Centauri 4. Vance is given Yandu's bow and arrow, but Yandu is able to break them out since his arrow is made of yaka, a sound sensitive metal that can change course based on special whistles. But sadly, not to the extent of the movie version. Yeah, for Yandu, there is going to be a lot of nothing like the movie version in this. Yandu and Vance meet up with Charlie and Marty, and they all band together against the Badoon invaders. And those are the founding members, Charlie 27, the last survivor of Jupiter, a colony with 11 times the mass and 3 times the gravity of Earth, giving him superhuman strength and durability. Martinex, the last of the Pluto colony, with the ability to convert light waves into bursts of extreme heat or extreme cold. Major Vance Astro, the first Earthman into space and the last survivor of Earth, who just so happens to be a master of psychokinesis. And Yandu, the blue-skinned native of the Alpha Centauri IV colony, the last of a race of barbarians and a master of weaponry. Next, they appear in Marvel 2 and 1, number 4 and number 5, when The Thing, Captain America, and Sharon Carter get sent to the 31st century. The presence of these contemporary heroes inspires the Resistance and the Guardians of the Galaxy to rally and take back New York City. Cap, Thing, and Sharon return to legend while the Guardians await their next appearance. Steve Gerber wrote this and Sal Buscema drew it, and Gerber must have really liked these characters because he brought the Guardians back in Giant Size Defenders Volume 1, Number 5, where Nighthawk finds the Guardian spacecraft, the Captain America, and Vance, Martin X, and Yandu come out to survey upstate New York. I do love how upstate New York is this generalized term in all Marvel, so you can have characters be in a rural environment or a small environment while still being able to hit New York City in the same issue, as though it doesn't take, you know, seven hours to drive from one end to the other. Anyways, Vance, Martin X, and Yandu are in this time tracking Charlie 27, who is in New York City and had already stopped a mugging by the time that they arrive. The team teleports to Charlie's position, which is actually in a crowd watching Valkyrie, Doctor Strange, and Hulk battle Eolar, who was created from the radiation of a Badoon mental programming device thing. They best Eolar, and we learn that the Guardians are currently traveling trying to find lost historic records, though apparently there was no actual record of what they were looking for since the Silver Surfer took out the Badoon invasion fleet in the 20th century. Martinex also runs into a young boy named Vance Astrovic, who prefers the name Vance Astro. Dun dun dun. In the Defender series proper though, written and drawn by the same team as the giant size we just went over, with the addition of V. Coletta on art, number 26 has Doc Strange explaining that because Vance is now technically at two spatial points on the Earth, the Earth is grinding to a halt on its axis. While Charlie and Martin X repair their damaged ship, Vance talks to his younger self and we get the history of Earth 691, from when the ozone fell, the bionic wars, the formation of the Confederation of Nations. That actually was harder to say than I admit. The 2001 invasion by Martians, Kill Raven and the Rebellion against the Martians, the Reign of the Techno Barons, the Second World Federation, genetic engineering allowing for subspecies for specialized planetary colonization, and then finally the conquest of the Badoon, which has decimated humanity. Doctor Strange, however, wipes the boy's mind of the history lesson, sends him home, as the Defenders and the Guardians board the ship to go to the 31st century together. Issue 27 through 29 are the Defenders in the 31st century, helping the Guardians with their war on the Badoon. 
though it gets tricky as the Badoon manipulate the teleporters to send Major Astro and Valkyrie to a swamp world to be eaten by hairy Badoon women, and marooning Hulk and Yandu on a planet of drunkards and robots during the Festival of Death. With the divided team and Doc Strange out of commission as he searches for the Lost Companions, the Badoon Elite Guard board the Captain America, taking Nighthawk, Martin X, and Charlie to be executed. Doc Strange is able to locate and beam Vance and Valkyrie back for assistance, though it does take a little bit longer to get Hulk and Yandu. And thus they set their sights on Badoon High Command to free the enslaved Terrans. And with that victory, the human slaves are free for the battle to retake Earth. However, the Defenders are zapped back into their own time by Star Starhawk, a new ally of the Guardians who Valkyrie and Vance met on the swamp planet of the Sisterhood of the Badoon. So the Defenders head home while the Guardians stay to continue taking back Earth. What's interesting for this story is that it introduces the gender specifics of the Badoon, with not only a sex difference in their species, but culturally. The Brotherhood of the Badoon deal with childbirth and everything like that, and since they only want strong Badoon men, they send the women to a swamp planet where there's a society that I assume started out of necessity, but has grown to enjoy its place, if still horribly bitter towards the men. Secondly, we get the introduction of the character Starhawk, who will become a driving plot device throughout the rest of the team's life, for better and worse. So after that run with the Defenders, the Guardians of the Galaxy get their first real solo run in the pages of Marvel Presents, starting with Marvel Presents number 3, which, wouldn't you know it, Steve Gerber hops in to write, this time taking artist Al Milgram with them across the galaxy. It does start more or less where the Defenders left off, with the Guardians fighting the good fight to overtake Earth from the Badoon. And of course, they do succeed. They take back New Moscow, the seat of the world government, and the Badoon are defeated. But not wanting people to give in to their basest emotions, Starhawk calls the Sisterhood of the Badoon to come and collect the men, as they have far more cause for vengeance than the once enslaved humans. The locals, of course, don't agree, but Starhawk blinds the crowd so that they can be shipped away. He has to repeat this act in most major cities, but the Badoon are now gone, and rebuilding can occur. Yet, the Guardians cannot adjust to civilian life during Reconstruction, so they head off to continue their adventures and protect other worlds. First, they take a quick detour to Centauri 4 so Yandu can pray to his gods before they continue on. Meanwhile, Vance Astro gets a real glimpse of the mystery that is Starhawk when, during a heated argument, Vance gives him a mental blast that, for the merest instant, shows a female face part from his body. Dun dun dun! But before that can become a real issue, the ship is under attack. They tractor beam the ship that's attacking and meet their newest companion, Nikki, the last of the Mercury colony. But fear not, before real character development can happen, a giant life-sucking anti-energy being that Yandu calls Karanata eats Starhawk and damages the ship before vanishing. The Guardians beam over to the nearest planet, trying to find parts for repairs. Though after a series of absurd events and people, they are beamed to a mysterious ship. Apparently, the planet that they went to to get repair parts is actually an asylum planet for the mentally ill. The caretakers assist in repairing their ship, and they're back off on their star trekking, only to run into Karanata again as he's devouring a planet. The impulsive Nikki charges forward with the ship, caring too much for the lives on the planet to think about her own. The crew obviously gets devoured by the energy monster, and crashes into a desert planet. Vance, who has been snapping a bit too much lately, stays on the ship while the rest of them go out and explore, discovering Starhawk and a church that worships the end of that planet. Speaking of the world, Vance decides to try and fly off planet, but instead flies straight through the sands, erupting on the other side of not a planet actually, but a giant man thing. Not that man thing. Not to mention there's this weird thing where a copy of Vance looking young and healthy comes onto the ship, but honestly I don't think that ever actually leads anywhere. Long story short, Nikki is used to destroy the man planet, with powers given to her from the church. With that adventure over, they fly off. Issue 8 is another history lesson one, and has the Guardians watching a hollow vid of the Silver Surfer saving Earth from the Badoon in the 20th century, which, fun enough, is written by Stan Lee and John Buscema drawing it. But the real character stuff is that Vance feels guilty that people shun Silver Surfer during his time, and destroys the video in rage. Issue 9 through 11 shows us the origin of Starhawk as we start a storyline with pretty much his entire life. 
The issue starts with the split of Starhawk and Alita, the female that keeps swapping forms with Starhawk. And while all that's going on, the Guardian's ship, Captain America, is under attack by the armies of Arcturus. Time for backstory. So Stakar is from a genetics mason jar looking thing, and he gets adopted into the house of Ogord in the most humane way possible, where Alita is his adopted sister. Stakar, while growing up, always bucks the system, and he stumbles on a temple with an ancient hawk god statue in it. Alita follows him, they find a helmet, and Alita knocks it away before Stakar can put it on, causing it to turn turn her into energy and have her possess the statue. Stakar puts on the helmet then, and they're able to communicate and all that until boom, they fuse into one person, Starhawk, the embodiment of the Hawk God. But since Starhawk won't be used as a weapon and will only work for the betterment of everyone, General Ogord vows that he is an enemy because of that, and he must be destroyed. And that's why the Reavers of Arcturus are attacking. With issue 10, Roger Stern takes over as writer, still with Milgram as penciler, which tells the bulk of the backstory I just said, as well as the Guardians needing to defend their ship when they get boarded. And Starhawk flies off to Arcturus to face his past. Issue 11 wraps up Starhawk's origin and the current problem. When Starhawk faces Ogor, but Starhawk's children, who have been introduced in earlier issues, just not to any real extent, attack him, leeching away his power under the mind control of their grandfather. However, the Guardians burst in, yet even they are unable to help. All Vans can do is knock the mind-controlling circlets off the kids, and the children fade into dust knowing that they were just pawns. Sweet Christmas! By the end of this series, the Starhawk backstory gets all the more convoluted and insane, but at this point, at this early stage, Stern really makes it feel grand and yet so personal, or as well as could be done in 1977. The final issue of their Marvel Presents run has Charlie 27 saving the crew from a mad computer system that had taken over a starship yard called Dry Dock. Though once he does save everyone, they bring up that it could actually be a good place to stick around, or at the very least build their own new ship. And Stern must have loved this team as much as Gerber did, because they next appear in Thor Volume 1 Annual 6, where Len Wayne and Roger Stern co-plot, while Sal Buscema and Klaus Janssen illustrate. In it, Thor gets teleported to the 31st century by an exploding reactor, where a mysterious man then sends him into deep space to freeze. Meanwhile, the Guardians nearly get destroyed by a laser blast, so they go and investigate, but get deterred by a meteor storm summoned by the same mysterious man. Though within that time, Starhawk does find Thor floating through space, and they bring him onto the ship. Pulling the Captain America route, the Guardians unthaw him. Though it actually is kind of sad, because the Guardians' new ship is called the Freedom's Lady, so the irony is less ironic. After introduction and pleasantries are exchanged, they go in to take down Korvac. Now, Korvac's a villain that appeared and got soundly owned, in Giant Size Defenders number 3, but that was apparently him just allowing himself to be beaten or something so he could analyze and steal some of Galactus's energies before going back to the future where he stole artifacts and summoned his minions of menace. All of which Thor and the Guardians soundly defeat. Or do they? Dun dun. Okay, I'm gonna really stop doing that. There's a lot of dun 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 moments. Of course, Korvac isn't nearly as defeated as he should be, and that leads us into the Avengers portion of the Guardians' lifetime, starting with Avengers 197, with the phenomenal creative team of Jim Shooter and George Perez, though the creative teams will change very much during this, so I'm just gonna say that it's a Marvel group effort. First up is the continuation of the whole Korvac fiasco, starting in 167 and 168 of Avengers. It starts with Drydock poofing over Earth in the 20th century, causing the Avengers to go and investigate. This team of the Avengers is Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, Wonder Man, Scarlet Witch, Vision, and Beast if anyone's interested. So the Guardians are on the ship as well, and after pleasantries, or rather a brief scuffle between Beast and Charlie, we get the gist of Korvac's plan. Go back to the 20th century and kill young Vance Astrovic so he can't found the Guardians in the future, and then he won't be opposed when he tries conquering things in that future. But believe me, that plot is going to drastically change. Well, before they can deal with Korvac, government liaison Henry Peter Gyrick deals with some Avengers stuff, like how Avengers Mansion isn't that hard to get into when there's an 11 foot hole in the wall, and Old Man Jarvis as your security. Meanwhile, with all that going on, Starhawk runs off to fight Korvac in his current form. Through every plane of existence, all at once they fight, and it is spectacular. But sadly, Starhawk and Alita both lose, Korvac taking their life, only to give it back to them with a gloat and something that will bite his tuchus later. For the most part, the Guardians are on point watching Young Vance, though aren't really seen for a good chunk of this series, given that 169 through 172 
are the Avengers roster slowly vanishing, and 173 has the Guardians beam the last of the Avengers, that being Hawkeye, Thor, Iron Man, and Wasp, to an unknown orbiting construction. And whose is it? If you thought it was Corvax, then you'd be wrong. It's Granny Goodness! I, I mean, it's the Collector. Number 174 is actually kind of awesome. It's not very Guardians related, but it shows why Hawkeye is one of my favorite Avengers, as he single-handedly, though multi-arrowedly, takes down the Collector and frees every other Avenger. However, the Collector gets obliterated by a mysterious blast that resonates from Earth, all because he sent his daughter down to that man to try and betray him. For shame. Yes, we as readers know that being as Korvac, though they do a good job of hiding that if I weren't reading this from the Korvac Saga trade. Number 175 and 176 for the Guardians is just Starhawk being asked to help figure out who the enemy is, but since he was recreated by Korvac, he forgot that encounter entirely and can't perceive Korvac at all, but when they do finally narrow it down, the only thing that does give Korvac away is the fact that Starhawk can't see or hear him. Oh, and we do get a full origin of how Korvac became the blonde guy he is currently. 177 is the climactic battle with a Greyhound bus full of Avengers, including but not limited to Moon Dragon, Miss Marvel, Captain Marvel, Black Widow, Hercules, Quicksilver, plus all the Avengers mentioned before, and Nikki, Charlie, Martin X, and Yandu squaring off against Korvac. And the first thing Korvac does is blow up Dry Dock, with Vance Astro seemingly aboard it. And so the giant fight begins. It's actually a really valiant effort with everyone giving it their all, and they do technically ultimately win. Not by strength or magic, nor any any power that they possess, but Michael Korvac died because they killed his hope to free humanity from eternity. The whole thing ends with Moondragon giving a teary send-off. Boy, howdy everyone needs to read this. It is honestly the most bittersweet ending ever, with great writing and some spectacular character moments. Though unfortunately the Guardians after the first two issues are sidelined to being a yeah we're still here kind of cameo spot through most of the ten issue storyline. It is still a really good read if you can negate that Korvac had obviously been evil until this story. After that story, the Guardians make an appearance to say goodbye in Avengers 181, using a ship from the Collector's Collection to get home. However, on an Avengers front, we do get Gyrick bringing up that since the Avengers are government-sponsored, they have to be equal opportunity, kicking out Hawkeye to be replaced by Falcon. It's sort of comical to look back on now, but it's not Guardians-related, so that'll have to be talked about in another show. Let's continue with the Guardians and hop over to Miss Marvel Volume 1, number 23, written by Chris Claremont with pencils by Mike Vosberg. After a fun date, Carol is abducted and brought to Dry Dock, which I failed to mention is okay now, and Vance is back to being his chipper self and not dead. Not sure how that worked out. The other Guardians are over checking out the Collector's ship and everything else there, so it's just up to Vance, who realizes that this is the real Miss Marvel, even though he doesn't recognize the black singlet costume. They defeat the minuscule baddie, the faceless one, who's too obscure even by my standards to track down. Fine, he appeared in Astonishing Tales number 2. Thank you annotation box. And basically, the Guardians stick around in the 20th century so we can get Marvel Team Up number 86. After a misunderstanding, Spidey joins up with the Guardians to help them stop an evil corporation from raiding Dry Dock. Hammer and Anvil are the mediocre villains they have to face at the end, and really it plays out pretty standard for a one-off quickie. Of course, in Marvel 2 and 1, 61 through 63, we get Starhawk teaming up with Ben Grimm to save Alicia Masters from a woman who wants to revive Adam Warlock. And it's because of love with whom Moondragon is trying to help peacefully. So, Ben and Starhawk have to go to the Baxter Building, get a Skrull ship to follow them to Counter-Earth's moon base, where the High Evolutionary lay slain. Her, the chick I mentioned earlier only goes by her, revives the High Evolutionary, who is shocked that Counter-Earth is gone, and Alicia tells Ben to help them because she wants her to find the love she found in Ben. So now it's Ben, Alicia, Starhawk, Moondragon, Her, and the High Evolutionary out to seek the planet. They do find the planet, and Her does actually revive Adam Warlock's body. However, his soul is in the Soul Gem, currently being held by the Gardener, so she flies off to continue her quest, and the rest can go home. Yeah, just some quick fluff there, though I think Her is actually the character Kismet, or Alicia, or whatever her name is, which comes up much, 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 much later, towards the end of the Guardian of the Galaxy book proper. 
For a real bombshell issue though, Marvel 2-in-1 number 69 has Vance go and talk to his younger self, causing a cosmic fog of doom that everyone comes together to try and stop. He unlocks his younger self's psychokinesis and learns that he can actually take off his suit due to some regeneration thing. But for the group, it's huge with Vance actually having a reason to not be a bit of a downer all the time now. So let's travel to 1990 when the Guardians of the Galaxy finally got their own ongoing series, not under someone else's banner. Oh wait, sorry, instead of doing this in publication order, let's hop to 1991 in a series of four annuals that explain how they came back to the 30th century from the 20th century. All this is told in the four-part story Corvac Quest, which ran through four separate annuals in 1991. The first annual, Fantastic Four Annual 24, is where we learn that Korvac didn't actually kill himself. He sent his essence, energy, mojo, whatever you want to call it, to a different place to avoid the ultimate nullifier, because apparently Galactus had used it on him since Korvac stole Galactus' power and all that jazz. Well, the Guardians of the Galaxy and the Fantastic Four team up to find him in Australia, inside of a female body. Oh hey, a cameo from Gateway. Neat. Don't know who Gateway is? He's an Australian Aboriginal who worked with the X-Men during their Outback days. So long story short, Mr. Fantastic uses a pocket time travel device to redirect the ultimate nullifier from when it was originally going to hit Korvac's body to the new vessel in Australia. But Korvac sends his consciousness to one of his ancestors in the far future. Well, the far future of the 26th century. Thus begins their adventure in the Mighty Thor Annual 16. This era's Thor, Dargo, assists them in their fight against the tubby put upon working class descendant, Varley. While they do hold their own, they can't land a hit on him, so they fall back and regroup, but Varley does find them. Eventually, Thor redirects his super eye beams back at him, and the Korvac energy goes somewhere else. In Silver Surfer Annual 4, we're still in the 26th century by the way, the power inhabits Marshak, a man who has used it to create a utopian society and is good friends with the Surfer. So when the Guardians show up to take that power, it is an all-out fight. Though when Surfer learns that the man's power is rooted in Galactus, he stops fighting and actually talks Marshak into, after using it to repair the damage of the fight, letting the power go, where it then jumps to the 30th century. The Guardians follow the power to 2977 AD in Guardians of the Galaxy Annual 1. They find Korvac's birth location on the blue area of the moon and begin to fight with Korvac's father, who currently wields the power. The battle eventually leads them through the Watcher's domain until Korvac, the enemy, is born. And with that, Korvac regains his power, but he is still a baby. Now they have to figure out how to bring the baby to Galactus to end all this madness. Krugar, the Sorcerer Supreme of this time, and Doctor Strange, the Ancient One, appear. They put him in a mystic bubble and bounce over to Galactus' crib, where he reabsorbs his power, but leaves the baby's fate in the Guardian's hands. They decide to return the baby to his mother, which goes well, and Alita is made a full-fledged Guardian, complete with a new plunging neckline. While it is by no means a bad read, and it is a decent sequel to the Korvac saga, the biggest thing that hurts this is that it's a comic book in the 90s. While I do know it is technically only 91, so it's not deep into the 90s, the whole thing should have been building to this big drag out. But each issue, even the one where the guy with Korvac's energy went peacefully, we needed to have this padded out huge fight. But then again, each fight is different enough and unique enough to be nifty, so it ain't too shabby regardless. Back over to the main start of the Guardians ongoing, Jim Valentino pulls double shift as a writer and artist for the very first Guardians of the Galaxy number one, and it starts off in the middle of an adventure. So let's try doing this chronologically as it's depicted in the Mystic Fire mid-story. After their exploits during their team-ups after the Korvac saga, they went back to their time where they decide to stick together because they're like family now. So eventually they find a book that belongs to Yandu's people where Vance swears one of the symbols and relics is Captain America's shield. They start following clues to the location and on the planet Korg, they are attacked by Taserface. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, your name is... It's Taserface? That's right. Do you... Shoot tasers out of your face? It's metaphorical! Which takes a group effort to fight, but only after he's defeated, the force of the Stark come. Who are the Starks? Game of Thrones jokes aside, when the Martians began their invasion of Earth, Tony Stark, fearing his tech would be used for evil, threw it all onto a rocket and launched it towards the sun. But as usual, when Stark launches rockets into space, it lands on a planet. 
Okay, really bad Planet Hulk reference there, but regardless, it lands on a planet where the natives start using that tech to basically strip mine their planet and then become an evil plague going world to world to enslave its population and mine their precious materials. This history lesson brought to you by Uatu the Watcher. Uh, where was I in the comic? Alright, so the Starks attack and the Guardians fight them off, though Vance Astro gets his suit damaged, and we see that he still can't leave his suit. Yeah, I'm suddenly really unsure of the continuity that carried over to the new ongoing, but either way, Alita kills somebody. Yeah, midway through the fight, Alita just kills someone, and then her and Starhawk unfuse to become two separate people again. Starhawk is okay, but Alita is comatose, and Starhawk flies off. Yeah, that's a recurring thing, just him flying off. The fighting continues until they flee to the Freedom's Lady, where Vance gets an adamantium armor for his arm and part of his chest. Looks cool. But a Stark ship confronts them. Starhawk returns just in time to watch as the Freedom Lady is blasted into pieces. Fire Lord, the former Herald of Galactus, now Protector of the Galaxy, which does seem to be a trait for all Heralds Galactus chooses, arrives at the behest of Starhawk. Starhawk deals with the orbiting ship, while Fire Lord goes down to the planet to assist the teleported Guardians. Though they do win the four-issue battle with the Starks before Fire Lord even makes it down. Except Taserface, who will not give up. I'm sorry. I am so sorry. I just keep imagining you waking up in the morning, sir, looking in the mirror, and in all seriousness saying to yourself, You know what would be a really kick-ass name? Taserface! <laughs> That's the way he in my head! Fire Lord, however, ends him very quickly. Meanwhile, a group known as Forest, having been introduced an issue or two ago just on a couple pages, are off elsewhere, where we learn they too are after the Invincible Shield. They are Photon, who can fly and has deadly eye beams. Broadside, who is able to draw mass from any planet she's on to augment her own strength. 85, a pink Kree mutant with a mastery of magnetism. Brawl, able to control his density become intangible. Scanner, a snark, oh yeah, those are things, who can track people across the known universe. Tachyon, a being made of pure light who can fly at the speed of light and redirect energy back to its original source. Make up the team with one other fellow, Interface. He's a leader of the group with a superb intelligence and the ability to alter chemical compositions, and yet could never get his nose back from his grandfather. But they really aren't doing anything right now, so this segue was pointless for the moment. Back to the Guardians, they secure the Stark ship that blew up the Freedom's Lady as their getaway vehicle and get going. Fire Lord becomes an honorary Guardian of the Galaxy and goes back down to the surface as the newly christened Captain America 2 hops into hyperspace. The Guardians decipher the final clue and head to a planet to get the prize of Antag, but the sentient computer on the planet, Mainframe, as most sentient computer systems like being called apparently, pits them against Force. Oh hey, see, it wasn't that out of place as I thought. First round is Charlie27 and Martinex versus Broadside and Brawl. Well, let's say that after I get mentally scarred from Broadside trying to, uh, fraternize with Charlie, the fight starts with Brawl shattering Martinex, and Broadside laying Charlie out flat before they're all beamed away. Round 2, this Yondu, and Nikki versus Photon and Scanner. Oh, did I mention that Photon is a Centauri? More importantly, she's probably the last Centauri female, so Yondu is all about wanting to continue the species with her, and therefore won't fight her. Cultural fun fact, the earrings Yandu wears in this series are actually an article of clothing known as a kuspa, which are worn as a sign of adulthood and exchanged with the opposite sex as a rite of marriage. Neat. Well, Yandu gets owned by her eye lasers that apparently only she, out of every Centauri, has, but Nikki does pick up the win on this one actually incapacitating Scanner, but almost killing him before they're poofed away. Yandu, of course, takes Photon's rejection well. Also, we get the dramatic, Marginex is dead! Only reason I'm bringing this up is just I really love the art for this series. Round 3 is Starhawk and Alita versus 85 and Tachyon. Or rather, it would be if Alita and Starhawk didn't have a giant argument, so 85, who I swear is just Burt Reynolds in a Farrah Fawcett wig, can get the jump on Alita and Tachyon can get Starhawk. Though neither really technically get beaten fully, they are both teleported before any major fight really happens. And the final round is Major Vance Astro versus Interface. Well, Interface does beat him by poofing Vance's adamantium patch, so his bare skin is in the air. But silly Interface doesn't know how to turn the shield on to control the minds of the Guardians. It's sad, but a really good analogy for why not just anyone can hold the shield. 
Interface throws the shield away, and after a great speech about the ideals the shield represents, Vance is judged the victor, and the members of Force are beamed back to their ship. We learn that Mainframe is actually the Avenger Vision, and he gives them the coordinates to help them with a mission that was so very long ago in their history I had almost forgotten about. They leave to go find the lost colony of free Earthmen who weren't enslaved by the Badoon. Uh, go watch the first video and learn all about that. Let's not forget, on their run to the Lost Colony, Martin X is still in critical condition, and Starhawk is dealing with helium, while the rest of the crew deals with the derelict ship and the energy vampire Malevolence. But apparently, she's sent too soon by her father, who I think is Mephisto, just judging by her character design at this point, and leaves when she sees Starhawk. Martin X is back with a restored body. But all is not well, as the internal strife of the team is coming to a head. With Marty's new knowledge, he wants Vance to take command of the team. Charlie gets shot down by Nikki. Oh, and Yandu goes insane, tries taking over the ship so he can find Photon to try and repopulate Centauri. Plus, apparently now Vance can be suitless in his quarters due to something Marty did. At the very least, before everything becomes too hectic with cabin fever, they run into Haven, the lost colony of mutants Magneto led into space around the War of the World times. But as usual, when mutants are in control, humans are the oppressed minority. Going down to the planet, Starhawk grabs one of those lowly humans to give a nice rundown of the history of the planet. Starting with after the Great Injustice, which was basically the Mutant Registration Act, I assume, Magneto led most mutants to the stars, though some stayed for X-related reasons. On Europa, they built ships to go further, when Apocalypse assumably attacked. Magneto sacrifices himself to send ships to the planet Haven, where the legend known as Logan led them to find a spot on the planet to build a city. One of his descendants, Rancor, took charge of the city after ripping out her father's heart on her 16th birthday, as all of Logan's spawn apparently does. Her first act as leader was to enslave the humans, but there are very few mutants now. Yet they are all still so powerful, and the people are so bent on the belief that the Overmen will save them, that they do nothing. Right, do we have all that exposition done? Okay, so they split into two teams, with Nikki, Vance, and Charlie going to rally the resistance, while Alita, Martinex, and Yandu go to try and get a diplomatic solution from Rancor. The diplomatic mission ends kind of the way you'd think, with them being captured and held hostage. The resistance team teleports in only to find the resistance massacred. Vance and the remaining guardians get the population into the town square, and they hold a frontal assault while Replica, a shapeshifter who's on the side of the resistance, breaks out Alita, Yandu, and Martinex. Then all-out war happens. While all that is going on, Starhawk takes Gerard, the human from before, to a talking volcano which houses the Phoenix Force. Starhawk does get everyone off planet, so the Phoenix Force, now inhabiting Gerard, can pretty much glass the planet, or, and then flies off into the cold reaches of space. Great plan, I know. Actually, we learned that Starhawk uses Mainframe's powerful computers to teleport the entire populace to Mainframe's planet with the Phoenix as a power source. Yet Charlie and the rest of the Guardians are not happy with being left out of the loop by Starhawk on so many different occasions. But before they can continue the argument, they receive a distress call from Fire Lord. And what does Fire Lord need help with? Well, the Starks are back and Taserface, who was thought dead, has been given an upgrade and a new name, Overkill. Oh, and Replica joins the crew to Nikki's annoyance, because now she's not the plucky young one. As they reach Fire Lord, Overkill has all but one. They hop on their transparent spacesuits and go out to fight. It does not go well. Overkill could have, well, overkilled them whenever he wanted, but instead, all the Guardians did while fighting him allowed for a bomb to be planted on their ship so they would not have an honorable death in battle. Oh, jeez, this guy. Well, dying is certainly better than having to live an entire life as a moronic shitbag who thinks Taserface is a cool name. That's enough, Joe. The bomb only cripples the ship, though it would have killed Vance if Alita wasn't next to him trying to get into his tights. As with most things, before they could repair the damage, the spirit of vengeance, Ghost Rider, comes in for the attack. He takes out Starhawk, but Alita is able to calm the Rider down enough to clear up the mistaken identity. He thought that they were Universalites, who were responsible for conquering his planet with an oppressive regime that had corrupted the innocent. Well, at least it's not exactly the same thing as the Haven storyline, but hey, Replica is actually part of the Universalites, so Ghost Rider thinks they lied to him, and for that, they must die. But again, he comes to realize that they aren't all Universalites, so he flies off. Lovely. The Captain America 2 is getting repaired as the Guardians go and meet with the High Ruler of the planet Sarka. 
Unfortunately for them, that's the evil, corrupt planet of religious zealots that Ghost Rider was talking about. And they almost instantly decide that the Guardians need to be put in the indoctrination chamber, since they are infidels, though Yandu and Vance steal priest robes to escape. After having a pretty emotional talk with the crucified Martin X, Replica tries to free them, which fails, though Ghost Rider bursts in all kool aid Man style with Vance and Yandu, and the Guardians are all teleported away. They leave the planet without assisting, since everyone there is actually pretty okay with their government, and not in that freaky cult sense of being okay either. So now that they're traveling through space to go to Homeworld, I can bring up that Starhawk is now intangible thanks to the Ghost Rider attack, and apparently with some flashes to Mephisto gloating about his plan and his plane of hell, laying out that Malevolence is his daughter, and she's working with Force now. Got that? Great, because when the Guardians hop out of hyperspace by Homeworld, Force attacks. Though it goes a bit differently than last time. In his weakened intangible state, Starhawk can knock out Braille. Charlie and Broadside actually do end up hooking up awkwardly. Replica gets found out that she's a Skrull when 85's the Kree do not kill children, and she goes berserk, cause that's a lie to her. Martin X actually starts talking to Interface about teaming up since Protégé, the kid that Malevolence wants, shows great power. And Photon gives her a backstory about, because she was born with killer eye beams, that her tribe threw her into the woods to die and killed her mother, so she hates all Centaurians now. This all culminates in the 40-page blockbuster Issue 16. It begins with Yandu instinctively reacting to Photon's attack by slitting her freaking jugular. Interface reacts in anger, transmuting Yandu's hand to air before they rush to sickbay to try and save Photon's life. Starhawk talks Replica down from killing 85, but Brawl goes down to planet to warn Malevolence of Force calling a truce with the Guardians. And they replace Yandu's hand with a nifty Swiss Army hook. While all that is going on, Alita flies down to the planet to talk to Protégé, and Alita and Malevolence have it out. But Protégé, the most holy, stops to learn more about Alita and her light-based powers. It then lays out that Malevolence is trying to sway Protégé, who is actually the magus and a god that can use any power or skill he sees in use, into being evil, but Alita tries to teach him benevolence, while Malevolence attacks her for it. Long story short, Malevolence does kinda win, but Replica, being of the universal light, faith that worships him begs for their lives. She becomes protege's plaything, and thus she leaves the Guardians with a tearful goodbye. Back on the Captain America 2, Yandu and Photon come to an understanding, with Yandu giving her his Yaka arrows now that he's one-handed and cannot use a bow. Force leaves with the knowledge that one day the two teams will cross swords again, and with that, the Guardians begin to eat at each other again, this time Major Vant Astro quitting the Guardians and setting a course for Earth to be dropped off. The Guardians vote Starhawk out, but when they arrive on Earth, the cities are in ruins. This is when we find out that it's been about four years since they left Earth, while society was still in reconstruction. Going to the remains of New York City, the Guardians run into Terran, a crucial player in the revolution against the Brotherhood of the Badoon. They all go to the sub-sub basement of Avengers Manor, and here is where we get another history breakdown. We learn that in the four years the Guardians were gone, an interactive hologram software became so addictive that the older generation died out and the kids took to the streets in gangs with all these turf wars. The strongest and most ruthless gang? Isn't it obvious? It's gotta be the Punishers! Vance and the rest of the Guardians stay on Earth, all except Martinex. Martinex leaves the planet to go back to Mainframe and work out how to make other teams of Guardians of the Galaxy. As Vance takes the leadership of the Guardians, however, he's shot in the head. Which is a real feat, considering apparently they did give him an adamantium-laced suit last time. Thus, we learn that Darganite can actually crack adamantium. As the rest of the Guardians begin to fight with the Punishers, Krugar, the Sorcerer Supreme, comes to save Vance Astro's life. However, the fight with the Punishers is not going well, but the Guardians escape thanks to the Catman known as Talon, who leads them to the Bronx, which looks great by the way, but they are cornered. And here is where we learn that the Punishers are actually working for the remnants of the Badoon. As the Badoon order the Punishers to open fire, however, Major Vant Astrovic, out of his containment suit finally, and his hair is looking perfect, throws his shield, taking out the shooters and springing the Guardians into action. Going by major victory now, he leads the Guardians and the Commandeers to victory against the Badoon. Kugar accepts one of the communication stars of the Guardians, but not a full membership, and Talon joins the main Guardians. Elsewhere, Martin X is still working on trying to get the details for his Galactic Guardians with Mainframe's help. So with Jim Valentino still doing whatever he does, Jim Montano on inks, and Evelyn Stein on colors, let's keep going with Guardians of the Galaxy number 21. 
It begins with Rancor searching for Wolverine in Madripoor, cause she thinks he's still alive. Over in New York, the Guardians are going about their usual drama. Talon turns down Nikki's advances, Yandu turns down Terran's advances, and Vance laments after training that he is finally able to have a real relationship with Alita. But she was now reabsorbed into Starhawk. To break up their Dawson's Creek mundanity, they receive an anonymous message showing Rancor, and they head to Madripoor to stop her. Elsewhere in the cosmos, Starhawk fully absorbs Alita, but now has the powers of darkness, similar to Alita's light constructs except, well, evil and dark. The Guardians actually hold their own against Rancor's crew this time, before Starhawk appears and basically says, Screw y'all, I'm evil now. But Alita actually takes control to show that she can actually hurt Stakar. In the whole mix, Rancor and her crew escape, but then they do get caught up with, and they all fight again. But Rancor's crew mysteriously teleports away. They ask Dark Starhawk, but nope, he knows nothing, as usual. We do get that there may be some impending doom coming, but the Guardians go down to the Commandeer's headquarters, which is now the Guardians HQ, basically. While there, Alita tries to have a talk with Vance, but since she's trapped within Starhawk's body, he really doesn't want to talk about their relationship, since it can't really be a thing. Yandu and Talon have a talk also, with Talon showing that he has a little mystic ability, but was too wild for formal education. Culture corner time, Yandu's fin is called a tale, and it is in fact a crest. It's not proper to discuss what it represents, you know, if you know what I mean. Cause I sure as hell don't know what it means, since the chick centaurian had the same size mohawk. Yeah, how big was her dick? Then, after Nikki and Charlie have another moment about their ex-relationship, the commandeers call them to the monitoring room, where the Silver Surfer has been detected. Exposition dump time, Silver Surfer was one of the last defenders of Earth during the War of the Worlds alongside Captain America, Franklin Richards, and Doctor Doom. Yet Eon convinced Silver Surfer that Earth was destined to be conquered anyways. After centuries, he became the Guardian of the Universe and put on the Quantum Bands. Okay, we're all caught up. So Silver Surfer is riding along, heading to Earth to warn them about the coming of Galactus. But due to the events of Silver Surfer Annual Number 4, where he was mean to the Guardians, they attack him without question. Talon is actually the one that goes, Hey, shouldn't we hear him out? And they do. We hear the tale of how Dargo, a future Thor, the future Thor, technically the past Thor, but I talk about him in the last video. Fire Lord and Silver Surfer banded together 500 years ago to stop Galactus eating Earth, leading to Nova's death. While they were fighting, however, Zen La, the Surfer's homeworld, exploded. The Surfer blamed Galactus because he was too distracted by Galactus, and ever since has been using the power cosmic and the quantum bands to empty the planets that Galactus was going to eat. But he was fooled. Galactus is actually heading to the Centauri system. Surfer and the Guardians then speed off to stop him. In Guardians number 25, after more of Surfer's life story, we finally reach Galactus, but Fire Lord is already there trying to stop him. Which, who could have guessed, goes poorly for him. Charlie, Talon, and Starhawk pop on some really vintage looking spacesuits to go out to try the best they can to fight Galactus. Talon actually does some decent damage with magic, though the Ancient One pops up astrally to say, you shouldn't use that level of magic. But Nikki uses her heat to restore Fire Lord, and Fire Lord goes back into the fight hardcore. Meanwhile, Yandu and Vance have a talk about Yandu needing to go to his people, who are all still alive on a different planet. Vance gives him one of the communicator stars, so he can teleport to that planet, leaving the Guardians. Back fighting Galactus, Charlie rips off one of Dry Dock's main cannons and shoots at Galactus, but it's ineffective! Galactus swats the air in front of them, and Charlie and Talon are launched into space, saved only by Dark Starhawk, with Alita as the dominant personality if you want to keep score, but then teleported back to the ship so the next level powers of Starhawk and Fire Lord can go full blast against Galactus, to the same effect as before. Nada. That is, until Silver Surfer finally emerges, as large as Galactus. Everyone else gets back onto the ship as Eon returns to tell Silver Surfer that it is not Galactus' death that will save the day. Keeper, uh, Silver Surfer's current name now, actually uses his power to feed Galactus, becoming the harbinger of life to his bringer of death. Neat! So Eon now has Silver Surfer solely on Galactus duty, so Fire Lord goes back into being protector of the universe. Nikki, who's been trying to get into Fire Lord's flaming pants all day, still gets rebuked. Oh, and Yandu is reunited with his people as a good way to wrap off one hell of a tale for him. Whew. Issue 26 is about Talon and Nikki looking through the last of Vance's docu-chips, which are basically holocrowns, just don't sound as cool, all about the origins of the Guardians of the Galaxy, kind of. 
We get Charlie 27 and Martin X meeting, though I think they added a little racial issues in here. And we also get how Yandu and Vance met, with Yandu trying to rip his heart out. But overall, this is just a welcome to the series issue, a perfect hopping on point from 1992. So 23 years later than when it originally started, but hey, better late than never. Really, the big thing about this issue, though, is that after they're done watching the inspirational docu-chip, Starhawk enters to tell them that they are going to go back in time and stop the Badoon before the big invasion ever happened, without Vance's knowledge. And that follows right into the next issue, where Major Victory is very much against this plan, even pointing out that Starhawk isn't even on the team anymore, so this is totally loony. But they're already on course and already in the 20th century, so he's already out of options. But Talon barges into the room and then collapses. He's dying and needs to be taken to Adelan, on the blue area of the moon. Yeah, apparently Talon is also an inhuman, as well as a magician. Neat! We cut to Adelan and the Royal Court. You know, Black Bolt, Medusa, Gorgon, Karnak, and those people. If you don't know who they are by now, well then Perlmutter's inhuman push has failed, and there is hope for the future. Anyways, the Guardians beam to present-day Adelan, though the Royal Court feels like it could be a ruse to blow them up, since the Infinity War event is going on at this time. No, it has nothing to do with the movie. As is the norm, don't you know, we get a fight. But Vance uses his psionic blast to stop the fighting so they can get a word in edgewise, and Talon gets taken to the medical center, while the attack on Four Freedoms Plaza, the Fantastic Four's HQ after the Baxter building was destroyed, is told to the crew of the Captain America, before sudden random evil doppelgangers of everyone attacks. The good guys win in spectacular time, and Talon heals up with a fun gag with Lockjaw. Then we get the history of the Inhumans up to the 31st century, where they were enslaved and put into a reservation under an Inhuman-run Atalan, and the only reason Talon escaped was because he was trained by the Sorcerer Supreme. Of course, this is to set up the traitor is a royal, but not an Inhuman. However, with that random tie-in issue to the current cosmic absurdity that was Infinity War, they go back to their ship and go to Avengers Mansion for another tie-in to Infinity War. Yep. Issue 28 is Dr. Octopus and his random band of, God, none of them are anything more than a C. Maybe a B if you're a fan. I mean, Oddball? Jackhammer? Powder Keg? Even I don't know who the hell Powder Keg is, and that's kind of my job. Actually, I love the explanation for why Doc Ock is with these guys, because they're dumber and easier to lead than the main Sinister Six. Oddly nice continuity. Anyways... These guys are going to attack Avengers Mansion because supposedly the explosion at Four Freedoms Plaza killed all the heroes. But of course that's not the case. So this tie-in is the Guardians of the Galaxies versus these, I don't even want to call them third raiders. However, Ak actually gets through the defenses of Avengers Mansion to let some more bad guys in. And sidebar, Starhawk fights his evil space doppelganger again, which could probably be interesting if I knew more about the Infinity War event. After the Guardian of the Galaxy 2nd Annual, which showed Martin X forming the Galactic Guardians with Wonder Man, Fire Lord, and a bunch of others that I'm sure I'll be talking about soon enough, we get the second part of the tie-in, where, while fighting off the new baddies, suddenly doppelgangers of both sides poof in to fight. So the C-List baddies and the Guardians team up to fight them. Then the C-Listers find out Ox a dick and chase him off while the Guardians leave Jarvis to clean up the mess. Oh, and Alita, if you remember her, is now the body and main mine in Starhawk, though she may have gone a bit insane with power. As for the next issue, number 30 is the big I quit from Vance. I mean, look at that cover! Vance can't stand by a preemptive strike against the Badoon, since they're talking full genocide. So they basically leave Vance on Earth to go kill the species. On Earth, Vance finds a prototype interstellar radio and actually sends the Badoon a message to warn them. I kind of really wish that there was more than two panels to make this decision to really add to the weight of it, but this has always been a fast-moving series, so I could see why the choice kind of works. But his signal also has a strange energy attached to it, and when it reaches the male Badoon homeworld, it shocks the receiver and transports UNLIMITED POWER into the random guy. Hmm, that might come up and bite someone in the butt later. Then we get the rest of the Guardians who are in danger of being detected because Takar and Alita are fighting over the corporeal body. So they take it outside and vanish screaming into space. So that leaves three people on this ship now ready to strike against the entirety of the species of the Badoon. And somewhere in there we get a shock. I hate the Badoon because they killed everyone I know, as though it wasn't the basis for every other Guardian's backstory. Shrug. The issue ends with Vance sighing and brooding around Avengers Mansion before Captain America is there to help a friend out. 
Yeah, they really brushed off Infinity War fast in this series, but don't worry, a binge shall come of that. Issue 31 has Cap and Vance training together, with Cap teaching him some better ways to use his shield, before being interrupted by Dr. Druid. Wow, there's an Avengers member that every kid listening's gonna know. Anyways, Dr. Druid tells them that they must keep their shields separated for the preservation of reality. Yeah, they pull a time cop with the two shields, but Dr. Druid pretty much instantly fixes it by polarizing them so they can never actually touch. Wow, that was almost needlessly pointless. Though, okay, it adds universe building because Marvel loves their continuity and how they handle divergent timelines and universes. I really should put a troll face up when I say that. Back with the other Guardians, the Brother Royal, the leader of the Badoon, shares some space face time with them to issue a challenge. Their best warrior versus the best fighter in the Guardian. Winner takes all. So in the follow-up issue, we have Charlie 27 versus a Badoon in the Captain Universe outfit. Lifeform thing. Captain Universe is a weird, extremely OP spirit thing that basically gives the possessed wearer day one pre-order bonuses. It was that too snarky? Either way, that means we get an issue of Charlie checking into the SmackDown Hotel, while Vance and Doctor Strange travel through the Dark Dimension so he can reach his crew members to try and stop them. Oh, and a plot point for later, Charlie tries using the sacred knife that Yandu gave him before leaving to try and kill Captain Universe, but it fails, with the Brother Royal being given the knife instead. This story is concluded in the next issue where everyone goes to the planet to save Charlie, but it's the combined efforts of Alita, who is now in charge of the physical body after taking her male half and putting him in a mason jar on her mantle, and Doctor Strange to defeat Captain Universe Badoon. Then they all go back to their time, now having Alita on their team, and Doctor Strange flies back to Earth. But Charlie was really brutalized. Can he survive? A blood clot forms in his throat, and he's choking to death. But that's okay, because... The next issue, issue 34, has Yellow Jacket come out of hiding to save Charlie's life to become a member of the Guardians. And Martin X calls to check up on things and decides that it's time for the Galactic Guardians and the Guardians of the Galaxy to meet up. Oh, and there's some sentient evil entity on the hull of Dry Dock that tries to contain the Dry Dock so it can complete its metamorphosis or whatever. But Alita dissolves them quickly and it darts off. Over with the Galactic Guardians, they're seeing the stars decaying before their eyes. To add on to this ham sandwich, the Sorcerer Supreme of the 31st century is caged in the Dark Dimension. Until we finally learn that all this is the work of the Dread Dormammu, who demands that they give him Doctor Strange. Issue 35 is weird because it's a tale of the Galactic Guardians fighting Bubonicus, a demigod of plagues and disease who was dissolving space because everything is a disease, before meeting up with Drydock and the Guardians proper to watch them explode. Ouch. So I guess I'll just randomly say the Galactic Guardians roster right now, just for expediency later. We have the former Wonder Man, Simon Williams, as Hollywood, Fire Lord, the Spirit of Vengeance Ghostwriter, Replica, a girl scroll that we all know, and leading the group is Martin X. With all that out the way, issue 36 starts off with a bang as Dry Dock is destroyed by Dormammu. But luckily, all the Guardians survived to be teleported to Icarus. That's the Galactic Guardian's ship. Before any reunions can happen, though, the heavy hitters, that'd be Fire Lord, Spirit of Vengeance, Elite, and Phoenix, all charge in at Dormammu. All that raw power is still getting fairly owned by Dormammu before Talon in a spacesuit comes out and starts casting spells to bind, or at the very least, distract Dormammu so everyone can rally. Eventually, Doctor Strange, who is the Ancient One in the year 3000-ish, does appear, only to pull a Goku and tell everyone to give him their energy so he can direct it at Dormammu, which ends with him getting a hole in his chest. Doctor Strange, not Dormammu. Long story short, the story wraps up in the next issue, now with Charlie and Yellowjacket fighting Dormammu in the ship because apparently everyone needs to get at least one punch in on him before Krugar, the 31st century Sorcerer Supreme, comes out swinging. Talon uses his spirit to channel the Ancient One into Krugar, and they all beat Dormammu. Talon actually receives an amulet for being so magically delicious this time around, and Martin X has Krugar teleport the Galactic Guardians to mainframe, giving the Guardians of the Galaxy the Icarus. The only thing asked of them is that they go back to Earth and check out the Commandeers and make sure they're all okay. Though we as readers already know what happened to the Commandeers and the goings-on on Earth. 
Over the last dozen or so issues, there have been random cutaways to showing how Dr. Doom has come to restart reality TV to become ruler, bringing in Rancor and other previous villains to help. But of course, that doesn't go well with the end of this issue being Rancor cutting out Dr. Doom's heart on live TV. Well, Vance Astro does have a quick appearance in New Warriors number 36, where he defends the character of Justice, the Earth 616 version of Vance himself. And we get some fairly heavy moments of Vance talking about his own personal abuse from his father, and how that's what made him find another father figure, such as Captain America. Actually, I'd like to say that this panel, which I do have up on the Comic Archivist Facebook page, really does bring up why there is often fan backlash against changing the fundamentals of a character. Double points for it being about Captain America's ideology after that Hydra secret empire BS that I'll cover eventually in some way. Back to the main series proper, though, with Guardians of the Galaxy number 38, and we get some very light relationship stuff with Vanta and Alita, who's grown cold and now wants to be called Starhawk. While Vance is blowing off steam after this talk, though, the Beyonder poofs in. A uh, bridged history of the Beyonder, who I may do one of these on, because hot damn, he's become a hot mess of a character by the end. At this point, he's just an omnipotent man-child. But he's only there to show that he's captured protege and malevolence, because he can, and to also give Vance black under armor, because why not? Also, Yellowjacket has a new outfit, too. Good for her. So, they reach Earth find everything that's gone on while they were out adventuring, and after a brief scuffle, they do show up in time to catch the fight between Rancor and Doctor Doom on reality TV. And here is one doozy of a twist of fate. Rancor has spent such a long time seeking Logan, thinking he was still alive, but the truth is that Doctor Doom is Logan's adamantium lace skeleton with Victor Von Doom's brain inside. Dun dun dun! I know I said I wasn't going to do that anymore, but that was actually a legitimately good twist that I didn't see coming. Next issue is a double-sized conclusion to the story, with massive fighting on all fronts. Rancor doesn't exactly beat Doom, but she does get saved from death by Yellowjacket, as little good as that does for Yellowjacket. However, after running into a mass grave, Alita decides to teleport everyone back to the ship and just blows the fusion react, turning the entire compound to dust and ending reality TV for good. With all that complete, Vance keeps the promise he made a long time ago and gives his shield to the new leader of Earth as a rallying symbol for all those under the warm freedoms of Earth or something like that. I actually really love this arc because while the wrap-up double-sized issue has a bit of padding with a lot of fights in it, the story was so built up over the last dozen or so issues that it wasn't just a story about the Guardians. To use the tagline the comic uses, it explored the Marvel Universe in the 31st century. It was nifty as all. Speaking of long-standing plots that I failed to cover while they were going on a couple pages per issue, issue 40 is the main push of the story involving the enslaved Inhumans on the moon, starting with finally giving the full backstory of Talon, with him growing up as an Inhuman slave and only escaping to become an apprentice of Krugar, the Sorcerer Supreme, who we've met several times in the story now. So, the Guardians hear the story and head off to the moon to save the Inhumans from the Iron Fist of Loki Lefaysun himself. Yeah, that was also another legitimate twist I didn't see coming. Yet, while sneaking through the mines, they're attacked by Composite, who's a, well, Composite, of the royal court of Inhumans that we know, like Gorgon and Medusa. Except, one Guardian isn't in the mines. Starhawk has decided to take the fight directly to Loki. This epic battle spills into the next issue with the main Guardian squad being separated so Talon can face down Composite alone. Eventually, they do find Talon's star combat thing, but it takes a bit of tracking to find Talon himself, alone against Composite and his gang of evil and humans. Phobia, who can make people see their fears. Wormhole, who can teleport people away. Stupor, who can scan physiology and compress the right cluster of nerves to, well, stupefy his enemies. And Imprint, who oddly just seems to have a caustic touch. Considering how he looks, I'm just a little disappointed. The Guardians save Talon, and the evil Inhumans run off to help Loki with his plan. We then get a cameo from Heimdall, who has about a panel of team-up time with Alita before Wormhole sends Heimdall and Alita wherever they go, as Loki begins his invasion of Asgard. But one man dares challenge Loki. The mighty Thor, sweet Christmas, that's just hilariously sad. Think we should call him the mighty thyroid condition now. So can the Pillsbury Dough God save the day? Oh, messy no. 
He gets his pudgy butt kicked harder than the Atkins diet before the Guardians teleport in and see how torn apart Asgard is. And that's when we get the updated version of Asgard living. Lady Sif explains that she and Thor got married, had a kid, but Thor would still go off on his adventures. Sif didn't mind taking on the adventure of parenthood alone, but Thor was never around so their son, Woden, became a broody little non-bastard bastard until Odin ordered Thor to come home and stay to try and help with the boy. Thor was resentful, but he did try. Yet the struggles of home life left him a shambles of who he was, even trying to strike Sif at one point. But believe me, he got his butt kicked for that attempt. And so Thor became unworthy of his hammer and spends most nights drinking with Volstagg. Yeah, it's a bit of a pointless backstory added to pad things along, but hey, I do find it interesting. Anyways, the Guardians fight the Inhumans until Loki reappears, ready to unlock Composite's muzzle, since he also has Black Bolt's destructive voice. However, lightning juts out as Woden, son of Thor, comes to challenge his uncle as a new face of the God of Thunder. Note how he kept his name Woden, and didn't change to Thor. Looking at you, Jane. Sorry, cheap shot, I know. So issue 43 concludes the storyline with some more fighting between everybody. Aaliyah and Heimdall do return after escaping from the Remora, which oddly is more like the plot to Thor Ragnarok than a comic from 30 years ago should be. Basically, what we get from this story is that we have a new Thunder God and not the Nordic Doughboy anymore, plus assumably freeing Adelan. But we don't have time to dwell after this. Sorry, Alita's emotional baggage. We've got another story to wrap up immediately after that Asgard trip. Starhawk uses her powers to travel to the beyond, since that's where... Well, first, the Guardians of the Galaxy Annual 3 has them returning to Earth for a quick adventure in future Ireland, where they fight an ancient Irish hero, Kuklan. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, and then meet up with the hero Shamrock after. It's a fairly decent in just a one-off way, but c'est la vie, back to the meat. Issue 44 gives us a recap, and then we go not to the Beyond, but to Alpha Centauri 6 to get Yandu to join, before they go to the Beyonder's homeworld. And Yandu's extremely angry with the Guardians. See, back when his knife was used in the whole Captain Universe Badoon story, the Badoon invaded Alpha Centauri 6 afterwards, and there was even crossbreeding. That's disgusting. So now there's Badoon Centauri hybrids that have all but wiped out the resources of the planet, and Yandu's species. On the Beyonder's world, though, Mephisto finds the Beyonder and cracks open the gem holding Protégé and Malevolence. Protégé, who can match any power, begins to battle the Beyonder, but even more than that, Stakar, the male Starhawk, has returned. So that means we get another drag-out fight between Stakar and Alita, as you do. On the Beyonder's world, the Beyonder flees the battle, and that's when Mephisto begins to work his manipulations on the young boy to become his friend. As for the fight between Stakar and Alita, that's interrupted by the Hawk God himself, and he fuses their hands together, so they'll forever be hand-in-hand hand to understand their combined might. After some bickering, the Starhawks do pop over the 20th century to give Alpha Centauri its proper history back, with no Badoon inbreds running around. While that's going on, the Beyonder pulls the Guardians to his world, but that basically just makes them easier targets for Mephisto, who says that Vance has been helping the Beyonder since the beginning of Malevolence's captivity, and I'm just left scratching my head, because that's not really how all this went down when the Beyonder gave him the Black Under Armor. Speaking of, Mephisto erases the preservation spell from Vance, making him rapidly start to age, until his suit starts to kind of act like a symbiote and engulf him, saving his life and making him strong enough to hurt Mephisto and Malevolence. Maybe the Beyonder did have like a long con going there. Then the Beyonder pops in before Protégé also pops in and then they go back to fighting before those two get summoned to the Living Tribunal. At the end of this issue there's also a small backup story called Talon Salon where he tries to find different hairstyles that actually came from reader submissions over the country. Plus a fun gag with Marge Simpson's hair. It's just a fun little thing. Issue 47 is the Guardians escaping the Beyonder's world, which is shaking apart. Alita and Stakar come back from their timeline change with Alpha Centauri all better, and the trial of the Beyonder and Progeny begins. But moreover, the last few issues had Hollywood, you remember Old Man Wonder Man, looking for any signs of Doctor Doom, which led him into a trap by Taserface, I, I, I mean Overkill who I would not be surprised if no one remembers because the Stark threat seems like forever ago. And issue 48 actually has a pretty heavy fight between Overkill and Hollywood that takes up most of the issue, though it ends with Overkill blowing himself up and Hollywood flying off a bit more perturbed than anything else. Issue 49 has the Guardians teleport to the Beyonder during the whole cosmic trial, but mid-teleport, Talon was taken by Mephisto, who then begins torturing him to try and get the Eye of Agamotto from him. 
The Eye of Agamotto was the amulet that the Ancient One gave him after the whole Dormammu stuff. Oh, and remember how Protégé absorbs the power of people he's around, a la Peter Petrella from Heroes? Topical reference, I know. Well, he's been around those cosmic entities for a while, so he now has all that power. Yeah. All this comes to a head in Giant-Sized Guardians of the Galaxy number 50. Talon, with his back nearly totally broken, escapes with the Eye of Agamotto's help, but it may not be able to escape the Underworld so easily. Yandu spiritually connects back with his god now that his people are strong again. And the hawk god takes away Stakar and Alita's power because there's about to be a cosmic slobber knocker. Talon, Mephisto, and Malevolence all pop back into the cosmic realm, and the Guardians put up a great fight against Mephisto and Malevolence before Protégé zaps the M family out of existence for daring to think about stealing his power. However, the battle ends with Scathan, the Approver, not approving of the situation and putting Protégé in a celestial muzzle. Alita and Stakar are given their powers back, and Alita now has gotten her crush back on with Vance, though now he is sort of back at square one in the stasis suit from Forever Go, though he is definitely based on Spidey's symbiote outfit now. Actually, I think this proves that the Beyonder is a huge fan of Julia Carpenter. Oh, just Google her. The Beyonder is sentenced back to his universe, never to escape again, though his power did create Vance's suit, so eventually he may be able to manipulate our universe because of it. Protégé is consumed by cosmic time and ceases to exist, much to the ire of the Guardians, who had seen the benevolent side of the boy, yet they're then sent back to their ship with a wave of the Living Tribunal's hand. And finally, Yandu honors his agreement and rejoins the Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, and Stakar learns that the people he thought were his parents were actually kidnappers planning on eating him. Eh, it does explain the mason jar. So now he's mentally imbalanced, thanks to not knowing who his real parents are. Ugh. Sigh. Honestly, while I'm trying to keep this less review heavy and more literally just binge reading and talking about the Guardians, I swear the Beyond Our Protégé storyline feels like it only exists in the Guardian of the Galaxy book because no one else wanted it. The Guardians didn't really do anything on that end of the story, and even their fight with Mephisto during it becomes meaningless when Protégé realizes he was trying to be manipulated. It's not a bad story by any means, it's just awkwardly placed. So with that serial closed, we hop to Guardians of the Galaxy Annual number 4. It gives us a wrap up of basically all the storylines to come before, with Rancor and Adelan and the Guardians going to save the day. The two interesting things that do come about this is that Yandu gets his faith rocked because his god Anthos may in fact be the mad titan Thanos. God, that would have been really cool in the Infinity War movie. And Talon knocks up Rancor. Yeah, it's not exactly consensual on Talon's part, being tied down and everything, but the only major thing that really truly does happen that will be followed up on is that Charlie 27 was left behind when things got too much of a cluster. So, in number 51, the Guardians finally return to Earth. They visit Kukulkan and Shamrock, who seems to be in Germany to figure out how to save Charlie 27. Charlie is currently being held at the Supermax artificial prison planet Stockade, trying to be forced to sign a confession. So, needing muscle, the Guardians decide to be in Kukulkan, although that does not go so well since he's been in the Stone Age since even the 20th century, so he doesn't know what's going on. Vance and Talon get into an argument about Talon's injury and his attitude since the fight with Rancor, which at least shows that something as serious as what happened to him affected the character without needing to make it a very special episode. After Talon storms off, Vance goes to have a moment with Alita, where they do try and kiss, but his suit tries to fuse with her. Yeah, maybe it's best to not accept any black suits from the Beyonder or his worlds. I'm just wondering if there's a space church nearby for him to get it off. Anyways, Talon tricks Kukulkan into augmenting his body into a more feral state. And I actually really dig this character redesign. He keeps faith with who the character is, except making him look a bit more butch, I think might be the best way to say it. Next issue, Talon is going full feral through the ship until Yandu, using his super cool spirituality and his level up points in animal husbandry, he's able to calm down Talon and get him secure in his quarters. In a really nice follow-up of their failed kiss in the previous issue, Alita has changed her outfit since her Starhawk uniform made her think of Vance's symbiote. God, I love the characters in this book. Either way, the Guardians are officially about to start their plan to free Charlie. Speaking of Charlie, he gets jumped in prison by Toka, or Slash, take your Ninja Turtles reference al dente, and won't be sent to the infirmary until he signs a confession. He refuses, but luckily his cellmate is Diablo. 
Oh, God, I wish. No, this is Marvel's Diablo, who was just an evil alchemist who faced off against the Fantastic Four for a while, but he may have a potion that fixed Charlie right up. Side note, I love how he's doing a painting of Dragon Man. It's the little things that make it so much more awesome. On the Icarus, Vance is not having a good time talking to the Warden of Stockade, so he and Cuckoo Clan beam over. Meanwhile, Talon is just going even more insane with power, so much so that Krugar actually poofs in when Talon tries using his amulet to gain even more power and knocks him out. On Stockade, the evidence against Charlie is this really damning video of someone who at least looks a lot like Charlie blowing up a bomb that killed millions. Yet because of the Warden's attitude, Cuckoo Clown punches his lights out. So the guards start swarming, but he womps them too. So now Vance and Cuckoo Clown are fugitives running throughout Stockade. But then, Security Measure Double D is implemented. They turn off Drax the Destroyer's cartoons. And that leads to what can in no hyperbole be billed as the Battle of the Year, Kukulan, the Irish Hercules versus Drax the Destroyer, back when he had a purple cape. Yeah, 1994 may have been a slow year if this is the Battle of the Year. But by God, it's a slobber knocker between these two and Vance, while Vance sneaks away. Basically, this whole thing just amounts to Charlie getting rescued and showing the warden a video that it had to be a clone that blew up the bomb since it doesn't have Charlie's scars. So with Charlie back, Kukulan heads off, but not before getting a special yellow jacket send-off, which I like to think is an old fashioned in the hallway outside the bridge. The Guardians then discover that the clone, named Ripjack, came from the quarantined Mars. Next issue, we discover that Mars has been quarantined for over a thousand years, ever since that whole tripod attack. You know, the one that really split Earth 691's history from the proper 616 continuity. While the Icarus is heading to Mars, we get Yandu and Vance having a heart-to-heart -heart about how Vance has kind of been acting a bit more volatile lately, ever since having the black suit, and Yandu's been a bit of a dick because of having a crisis of faith, since the Centauri god Anthos may in fact be Thanos. But that gets interrupted by the Mars quarantine units, Sentinels. It's good to see the Sentinels haven't changed in over a thousand years. The Icarus blasts the Sentinels fairly easy, and everyone beams down to the planet's surface. Oddly enough, they beamed perfectly to be in front of a war museum, and we get some decent history of the war, seeing some of those who fell, including the oddly touching moment where Vance goes to take Cap's cowl out of a display, and it disintegrates before he can touch it. It's only a couple panels, but it really does hammer home how much major victory has moved away from his Captain America clone days. We also get to see that Spider-Man was the last to fall, and someone had removed his body from a sarcophagus for... Plague immunization, whatever that means. Talon and Vance also have another pissing contest, so the team splits up. And that's when we get some minor muttering from Ripjack, who... Okay, I'm sorry, Taserface, for making that 90s joke way back when. This storyline came out in 1994, when things stopped being over-the-top hilarious and just muddled into that generic kind of sad over-the-top. So let's go into issue 55 and see just how badass, I use air quotes there, Ripjack, the intergalactic serial killer, is trying to be. Well, he wipes the floor with Talon, Alita, and Yandu, even taking the light from Alita. The rest of the team beams in, and we get Ripjack's backstory via random transmission. He was a scientist while a plague ravaged Mars, and in a desperate attempt to save himself, he used Peter Parker's body to try and make a cure, only to cause horrible mutations in himself, and he now needs to wear an external armor and is the last son of Mars, making him a bit of a darker version of Charlie, Nixie, and pretty much every other Guardian of the Galaxy member, since they're the last of their kind as well. But wasn't he supposed to be a clone of Charlie, because that's why Charlie was... This was like literally... Li what the hell? To steal a joke from Silver Quill, CONTINUITY! But that transmission was just to keep the Guardians standing still so the base could explode. And we also get Ripjack flying over to another planet, and we see how he kills planets. Of course, the Guardians weren't exploded on Mars. They have about six issues left in their solo series. Vance beamed them back to the Icarus just in time. Everyone scrambles to get Ripjack's trail, and Vance gets a hollow call from Martinex, who's questioning what Vance has been doing. I know I really haven't brought it up, but during this time, the Galactic Guardians, led by Martinex, have had a four-part miniseries all their own, but eh, it really doesn't have anything big in it, so just so, you know, it's a thing. Either way, Vance talks Martinex into helping Stonewall the many illegal things they just did. Then there's some more pissing contests between Talon and Vance, Yandu saves Alita spiritually from her loss of inner light, and just a lot of character stuff that was a long time coming before they find Ripjack. 
Actually, while they hunt him, we get shots of Ripjack in his ship, revealing what his true objective is, but it is still hidden from the main heroes, so we'll find that out in a little bit. But the Guardians do eventually find him, and they beam down Planetside, and we get a fight where Ripjack just walks right through them. But in that time, the planet's population have died in agonizing pain, making the Guardians feel really guilty by the end of this issue. We learn about the truth in the next issue, and see, even the cover says we will. Who is causing the plague? Bubonicus. Hey, remember him in that one-off Galactic Guardian story in number 35, I believe? Don't worry, neither do I. But yeah, so he's the real baddie, and Ripjack has just been mercy-killing planets that he's infected. I guess it's kind of neat? So now Ripjack and the Guardian of the Galaxy have a truce while they figure out how to beat Bubonicus. They know they will not be enough to stop him. And randomly, the High Evolutionary pops in, saying he's gonna go help. Hey, remember when he was in it before? Wow, they're really pulling all the big names for this finale. However, with all the animosity snaking through the team, Vance goes off alone with Ripjack and the High Evolutionary to Sanctuary, a planet of people there trying to atone in monk-like living. Ripjack and Major Victory kick Bubonicus's butt, though Vance and Ripjack argue about executing Bubonicus, before Bubonicus knocks Vance out. When he wakes up, the High Evolutionary has cured the population, but Ripjack and Bubonicus have left Sanctuary, and the High Evolutionary follows, leaving Vance in the lurch. Vance eventually gets back to the Icarus, but the Guardians aren't there. There's a recording of the vote against Vance Astro's position as leader. They've all taken a sabbatical to sess out their thoughts for their first free election for the new team leader. All except Yandu voted in favor of this election. However, Vance isn't alone on the Icarus, as Alita is still there, and they have a mushy romantic moment since way, 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 way back in, like, issue 15, if the annotation box is right. Vance asked Alita to marry him, and apparently they're still engaged regardless of literally everything that's happened since then. I've had an ex-girlfriend who may find that loophole use useful. Meanwhile, Stakar has been flying around for the last few issues, trying to figure out who his true parents are meeting up with Hollywood and they fight. Stakar gives Hollywood info on Doctor Doom being in his dome and Hollywood tells him to go find the Silver Surfer or the Keeper or whatever you want to call him. And Stakar does find him, just near death from a fight with Galactus, who has forsaken his contract. Yet, Stakar really only cares about his quest for parentage and tries to put on the quantum bands. Eon poofs onto the scene and tries to revert Stakar back into a child, but Stakar, through sheer willpower and, well, power power, will not go back to a child form ever again. It was all a test. And now Stakar is the bearer of the quantum bands that belong to his biological father, Quasar. It's neat, but ultimately boils down to Cosmic Blast, Quasar's history, and Sakaar trying to reach his father's graveside. Over with the main Guardians on their sabbatical, Charlie and Nikki are now in an official relationship, or at least heavily friends with benefits, as they get a rumor of Jovian slaves, you know, people from Jupiter, Charlie 27's people, so they're gonna go and investigate. Yellowjacket decides to try and go back to the 20th century, and Talon tries to get the Eye of Agamotto back from Krugar, but he becomes Talon fighting his own new primal nature. And that leads us to the final issue of the original Guardians of the Galaxy, number 62, Endgame. Stakar finds his mother, who is Kismet, which is hilarious since when she last popped up in here, she was her, and trying to resurrect Adam Warlock, who I actually thought would be Stakar's father. Stakar then has to fight Ira, the son of Eon, alongside his mother. And they win, and we have Kismet as a new hero active in the 31st century. However, the main bulk of the double-sized finale follows us back with the main Guardians, who have suspended their vote to go back in time to fight the Martians to save the Earth, and they do. But Wormhole, yeah, the guy who get three panels many issues ago, that just comes out of nowhere to send them through a mystery wormhole, and the Guardians crash on a planet. They all survive, but that's the end of the main series, with a hell of a cliffhanger. And originally, I was going to leave this here, since this is the end of their official solo, and they make a brief appearance in things like New Warriors number 68 or Avengers Forever, but there is one more important milestone for this team that has to be talked about. In 2008, Andy Lanning and Dan Abnett spearheaded a new Guardian of the Galaxy team, folding out of the Marvel Cosmic Event Annihilation and the sequel Annihilation Conquest. And praise the sun, it was good. Like, really good. Bestseller good. Hence why it became a box office hit when it became the Guardian of the Galaxy, even if the DNA run has very little to do with the Bendis version that made it to film. But I digress. 
So, in their ongoing, at the very end of issue 1, a mysterious figure holding a Captain America shield is seen in ice. Yep, Vance Astro is floating around on a big block of time ice. It's limbo, but you know, icy, to make it simple? I don't know. He does eventually get dethawed, but this moment is that fundamental moment like the Avengers finding Cap. However, Vance doesn't remember anything, so this is going to be a slow build, and believe me it is. Basically, this actually comes down to the same sort of thing that I would easily glance over during my giant rambles about the first Guardian of the Galaxy series, where it's a few pages per issues going just, hey, here's a bit of this story. In short, and by that I mean through several issues, Starhawk appears in a snazzy new outfit, he and Vance fight, though he doesn't know why, Starhawk poofs away, Vance gets somewhat situated to nowhere, the Celestial Skull City that the Guardians call home, before a new Starhawk shows up, this time a woman. Assumably this is the 616 version of Alita, who's there to kill Vance, since he's an anomaly. But the Guardians get the jump on her to end that. That plot gets a bit buried under everyone else fighting, and issue 6 ends with the chick version of Starhawk arrested while the Guardians seem to have split up. Issue 7 is where they reveal the very, 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 very loose origin story of the original Guardians of the Galaxy, though it brings up the Badoon using a zombie brigade for it, so take that as it is. But then again, Starhawk is the one telling the story, and it always ends with them failing for some reason. So that's why Starhawk keeps coming back to the present to try and correct everything. With the present Guardians, though I don't think they take the name officially until the end of this whole series, Vance runs into a zombie brigade. Fun fact, we also learned that the Badoon in the 616 are a third class alien race who aren't even a blip on the cosmic radar. Of course that's not true, as a Badoon, whatever the Howl's moving castle that is, drops into the field of combat. But after the Guardians busted up, the Badoon politely shrug and remove their war factory from the planet. Yet this plot actually gets interrupted from them needing to save Star-Lord from the negative zone and the whole War of Kings thing, where the Kree and the Shi'ar go to war. So it isn't until Guardians of the Galaxy number 16 that the storyline really comes to a head, when the present Guardians of the Galaxy poof into Avengers Mansion in 3009. And yes, I'll probably complain a little about the timeline and the final thoughts, but bear with me for now. Either way, they are then attacked by the original Guardians of the Galaxy, looking a lot less good looking? Sorry Craig, but I just can't get behind that art. I swear that's my last introduction to critique. But they aren't technically at Avengers Mansion. Well they are. But they're not on Earth. Starhawk brought the Star-Lord team to the future tense to show what she is trying to correct in 2009. And she also reveals that she knows the error, the Inhumans. Does this count as a gripe if I take my usual pot shot at the Inhumans now? No, that'd be unfair. This was when the Inhumans were actually an interesting facet of the Marvel Universe that I didn't wince hearing them involved in. However, before Starhawk can take the now Guardians back to the then, they get attacked by the Badoon. Starhawk sends everyone to the ship while she dives headfirst into battle. So now they have to go get the last cosmic cube from the heart of a celestial Dyson Sphere, but that becomes something all on its own, as the issue ends with all the Guardians, old and new, dying. Okay, technically they don't die, but it's a hell of a cliffhanger that skips the next issue to continue in... Issue number 18. Sort of. See... We begin with Charlie Nixie Hollywood and a more classic looking Starhawk fighting alongside Killraven, which means that this is all about the Martian invasion. And that's when the Star-Lord Guardians teleport in, although their ages are now very different, with everyone looking younger while Star-Lord himself is aged up, but they shake hands with Killraven's Guardians of the Galaxy. I swear I'm not going to be annoyed. They basically just help get the Martians on the ropes, but then get sucked back into the fault before they can finish the job. They hop through different universes until coming back to the Adam Megas War of Kings storyline that it's really shaking the Marvel Universe as it is. But sadly, the original Guardians team's story basically ends here. Vance does participate a little bit more, but he gets his stasis suit broken. He gets better to be a prisoner and on Phyla Vell's team when she decides to save the universe. He actually is a major player facing off and stopping the Matriarch. And he's even on the front line when Thanos comes out of his resurrection cocoon thing. Sweet. But it is here in the Guardians of the Galaxy number 25 that we see the importance of the handing of the torch. Starhawks of every iteration meet to discuss the error that continues to persist in the 21st century. They give Peter Quill and his Guardians of the Galaxy the mantle of the very first a thousand years before the one that that we started this video on, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yes, I was a bit long-winded in the wrap-up since ultimately the original team was only secondary characters at best in the DNA run of Guardians of the Galaxy, but I'm trying to be somewhat thorough. Vince does continue with this Guardian team for a bit longer, but that's where we are going to end the main summary of the 1969 team. 
And no, I'm not going to talk about Guardians of the Galaxy 3000. I'm annoyed at that still. And while we are technically done with the reader's history, the finale video where I talk about my final thoughts and general discussions on the original Guardians will be up next week. I'll even talk about what I think the future of the team should have been before it got cancelled. And yes, it definitely involves the fact that there was supposed to be a 31st century Venom storyline. I know it. So that is where I am ending for today. You can come back next week or you don't have to. But if you agree, disagree, or felt that I left out something in this super binge or just wanted to say your piece on the characters, let me know in the comments below. While you're down there, let me know what you'd like to see for the next Reader's History and check out our last Reader's History on Catwoman. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and please consider pledging to our Patreon. Trust me, it takes a lot of money and effort to do this, but even just liking, sharing, and subscribing can get us the help we need. And as always, I'm the comic archivist and stay golden inklings